Welcome to the American Institute of Healthcare Professionals videogram on the culture of death. And this video pertains precisely to our Christian counseling program and understanding the value of the fifth commandment and always preserving life, finding the dignity of life in everything that we do in our counseling and helping individuals appreciate the gift of life from God is essential. So this video will attempt to look at some aspects of Christianity in regards to life and death and some ethical situations that occur with in regards to abortion, euthanasia, and also the idea of self-defense and just war theory and so forth. So what is the culture of death? And it was coined by Pope John Paul II in his encyclical Evangelium Vitae. And in this encyclical, Pope John Paul II spoke about how modern society is beginning to push away from respecting life at all phases and beginning to have a disregard for the importance of human life itself. And this isn't just in Western society, but globally. And we see that there is a lack of respect for life. And historically, that has always been the case as long as evil has existed. As long as the first murder existed between Cain and Abel itself. But the Pope, especially the former pontiff who's now deceased, he especially emphasized in Evangelium Vitae the issue of abortion and euthanasia. The biggest thing that I think concerned the pontiff was how right and wrong moral objectivity was being lost. And with regards to the means justifying the ends for whatever we need to do, whether a human life is in the way or not, and reducing human beings to objects. And that's an object that we bought or sold, created in a lab, or rejected if conceived. So these ideas that were circulating in modern society devaluing the human being or something that he was concerned about and something that he stressed as something that needs to be acknowledged and something that needs to be rectified in this culture of death. And of course, the pontiff, the former pontiff referred to scripture and it's within scripture, the treasure of scripture that we find our faith itself. And within that faith, we have the Ten Commandments, the Fifth Commandment, the Fifth Commandment, thou shalt not kill, or more appropriately interpreted, thou shalt not murder. And this all-important commandment is emphasized throughout Scripture. In Proverbs, it states that the Lord detests seven things, and the spilling of innocent blood is one of those seven things. Obviously, the sin of Cain, when he killed Abel, and he asked God, he told God, am I not my brother's keep? Redundantly speaking, sarcastically speaking, because God wanted, God knew, but he wanted Cain to say what he had done to his brother himself. Christ emphasized in the new law that we're to love one's neighbor. And in the Old Testament, again, in Genesis, it's, it demands an accounting for a life of another human being. So unlike Cain, who pushed aside his responsibilities, saying that he's not his brother's keeper, Genesis says we are accountable for other individuals and their life and their well-being, more than just beyond not killing someone, but by not hurting someone as well. Christ in the Gospel of Matthew also again said, those who draw the sword will die by the sword. And again, this is referring to physical violence, unneeded physical violence itself. And again, in the epistle of John, as we see listed, again, we hear reference to Cain. Do not be like Cain. And in Romans, 
Paul reminds everyone that not to take revenge, for vengeance belongs only to the Lord. So these are just a small sample of scripture references talking about our responsibility as Christians. If we want to be true Christians, to love our neighbor as ourselves and to help our neighbor when they're in need instead of hurting our neighbor or of course the worst crime killing our neighbor within this culture of death we see that human beings are sometimes devalued though through propaganda and dehumanization the natural law is so clear that killing is wrong that excuses have to be made ends to justify the means or in this case a propaganda and a dehumanization attempt so with american slavery we see human beings reclassified as property individuals who were bought into slavery primarily from africa were not considered human they were considered subhuman and that was a way to clear one's conscience, even though it was quite obvious that these were fellow human beings, fellow brothers and sisters within the human race, created by God in his image and likeness, no more than those who bought and sold these individuals. And it was a great injustice. Hitler and the Holocaust demonized a whole population, the Jews, the Jews and the Jewish people. And this was done well beyond well before, I mean, Hitler, there had always been a propaganda against Jews, making them seem less than human, inhuman, treacherous, and sneaky. And these false narratives gave fuel to when Hitler came into power to promote a termination, a genocide against an individual group of people. Again, with the label that they're not human, they're not like us, they're different than us. And again, there we see that propaganda and that dehumanization. Abortion, the fetus is not human. And that's the most simple one that we can think of really is the fetus is not human. So if the fetus isn't human, it's not murder. If the fetus isn't human, then I can go to bed at night, even though I had an abortion. That's the thinking within someone who has an abortion or maybe someone who performs an abortion. They choose not to look. They choose not to accept the reality because the reality is too terrifying to know that they would then have to admit that their hands are filled with innocent blood. No more different. No more different than those who had held slaves who didn't want to admit that they had killed slaves or owned another human being. They didn't want to face that reality unless they were true sociopaths. Sexual trafficking is another example that we have where human beings are treated like objects to be bought and sold, kidnapped and used for other people's gratification and amusement. And this objectification of individuals for sex objects are a strong uh, are a strong breaking from what the fifth commandment commands of us itself so while our constitution was created to treat all equally it has failed numerous times to allow everyone to have that pursuit of life and happiness through slavery and now abortion itself, the killing of the unborn. And over 61 million children in the United States have been murdered since Roe v. Wade. And worldwide, 40 million children are murdered each year. And old English law, if you look at old case laws and such, old English law always saw abortion as wrong. And that was what foreshadowed our own laws in the United States before the before the abortion uh, was legalized. In fact, you could be tried for killing two people if you killed a pr pregnant woman or you injured a pregnant woman and it caused miscarriage. And in some cases, in some laws in the United States, you can still be charged for causing a miscarriage, which seems like a contradiction since 
the highest court in the land has deemed that a fetus is not human or deserving of constitutional rights. So abortion dehumanizes. The child is seen not as a human, but as an inconvenience. And isn't that why most individuals murder? Whether they're jealous or something is one thing, but most of the time, individuals kill because of an inconvenience. This person is in my way, stopping me from doing what I want to do. So pregnancy can be a major inconvenience. So how can we remove that inconvenience? murder and why not legalize it but the term murder isn't used because it's too powerful of a word it's too true of a word for the situation instead termination of pregnancy to lessen the shock value on the poor woman who might be misled who goes in well many of these abortion doctors know very well what's going on because they've performed so many abortions and they've seen the little hands, the little feet, the face, but yet they still do. So if not human, what is the fetus? And that's a question that abortionists really can't answer. They like to say it's a bunch of cells and so forth, but it's still our cells. So I guess for terms of regards to a counter abortion argument, I would like to talk about change in identity real quick for those of you out there. Uh, when the Western philosophers, the ancient Western philosophers looked at change, there were individuals who saw change as something that made something different, no matter what. Change uh, wouldn't allow you to be the same, no matter where you were. One day you were different, a river flowing it wasn't the same river. You, the individual, isn't the same individual because of change. So they looked at change and permanence. And if you were constantly changing in a state of flux, as Heraclitus taught, then you couldn't be stable. And then you had the ideas of uh, permanence, which taught that everything that seems the same is an illusion because there's only change. Fortunately, we had Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle who taught that change is a change, is an alteration of your attributes, characteristics, while the permanence is the substance of who you are. So when we look at uh, oak tree, how different is it than the acorn? And the acorn is the same as the oak tree, but the physical accidental attributes that make them look the way they do are quite different. However, the substance of the essence of it is still the same. So the acorn is the mighty oak, but at a different phase. Likewise, if you looked at a picture of yourself as an infant to a toddler, to an adolescent, to a young adult, to a middle-aged individual, to well into your elder golden years, you do not appear to be the same. The accidental qualities alter, but you're still the same person. And that goes on to whether or not you're in the womb or out of the womb, you're still the same person. So if you were in your mother's womb as a, and you were classified at that point as a fetus, you're still human. You don't magically become human at one point. You weren't something else. In essence, you were what you were quite accidentally different, but still the same person as you were. So the idea that a fetus isn't human defies common sense. It can only be one thing, and that is human, but at a different state of development. And states of development do not determine whether one has a right to live or not. Every state of development has inalienable rights to exist. You're charged with the same crime if someone was to kill a child or kill them as an old person. It's the same crime. Same crime should also be in the womb, but it's so much easier when the child is shielded by the mother's womb, inside the stomach, underneath the clothes, unseen, unheard, 
except for maybe a sonogram or a quick kick. Individuals want to ignore that. Again, dehumanizing. And that's why those who truly know what is in the womb are truly held accountable. And I don't want this to be a religious discussion. It's, it's science, it's biology, it's, it's common sense. You don't have to believe the scriptural verse that you were knitted in the womb. Although it's a correct statement, you don't have to be a Christian to be anti-abortion. You just have to be a human being with logical sense who understands science itself. And that's why it's so amazing to me that this genocide still occurs in today's world. With abortion though, because it's wrong, many women experience depression and guilt who have successful abortions because it's unnatural. It's unnatural for the mother to turn on the child. It's unnatural to think that the child is a parasite as if it's not a natural occurrence throughout the evolution of the human species. It's unnatural to separate the child from the mother's womb through artificial procedures that aim to kill the child. Abortion was originally, believe it or not, much opposed by the feminist movement as a way for men to control other women in terms of not wanting to raise a child. So it was originally much more a patriarchal move to control. It wasn't a woman's right move. It wasn't a feminist movement. Women quite naturally defended the children in their womb. But this was all corrupted with Roe v. Wade and the rise of liberalism and so forth. The truth is with abortion, there are many inhumane techniques. And if many saw how a child was removed from the womb through injections of various saline poisons or being torn apart, I think many would be, be appalled at the sights that have been seen. So as Christian counselors, you may come across women who've had abortions and they're going to need a lot of help. They're going to be dealing with grief, immense guilt, and they're going to need the help. They're going to need the grace of the Holy Spirit to heal and to find forgiveness from their child that is now in heaven. So that's a difficult discussion to have with an individual who has committed such an atrocity, maybe naively or purposely not understanding or maybe understanding, but they've now are seeking forgiveness and, and it is God to forgive everything. So it's important during these types of sessions to work with the individual with a forgiving type attitude. Now, helping women not turn to abortion is what we really want. We wanna prevent them from going that horrible direction. Not all of them are built with the moral compass necessary to overcome many of the problems that come with a pregnancy. Many women are left without a, a man in their life, the father in their life. Many women do not have the finances. Many women are terrified. They're scared, they're alone. They're afraid to tell their friends or family with the stigma. Maybe they come from a religious household and the, the stigma terrifies them. That they'll be considered uh, a whore of some type. And these types of stigmas need to be dismissed and the beauty of life needs to be celebrated even if life is created through sinful ways outside of the bonds of matrimony itself. So support systems need to be in place. The state has some, but it needs more. There needs to be less judgment on these individuals. We have to understand what they're going through, the fears, that they're experiencing, and we have to hold others accountable. Fathers have to be held accountable. Many fathers are pushing the abortion, but they have to be held accountable by the state. And of course, sometimes it's a little too late after uh, the DNA testing is much later, but there are ways retroactively to come back at individuals who are deadbeat dads 
who are not accountable. So you just can't blame the woman who's going through immense pressure, fear. It's also society as a whole. It's also the fathers who don't want to play a role in the pregnancy. And it's also comes a point where some Christians start to cast stones at these women. I think the true villains are the abortion facilities. The true villains are the abortion doctors who do this for money, and they take these poor women and confuse them. And those are the ones that we need to direct our ire at, these doctors who execute children for money themselves. There's been a term also being pro-life, not just pro-birth. And I think that's something Christians have to remember that we can't just forget the child after the child is born. So many individuals say, well, it's on you now, but there needs to be more social support for single mothers so that they know if they go to term, that there's gonna be support, that there's going to be help. The child needs to not only be loved in the womb, but children need to be loved as they grow with better funding for schools and, and programs that help develop children that come from one parent homes. And tax money needs to be put into that. So we have to be not just pro-life, uh, pro, uh, I mean pro-birth, but we also have to be the pro-life of the entirety. And that's, I think, going back to the culture of death, culture of death just looks at maybe one aspect or it looks at individuals not having value. The individual carries value from the day of conception to the day of death and the person deserves dignity. So if you're just concerned about being pro-life and you're more just concerned about the birth and then afterwards you walk away or you don't think the state should help these individuals, then you're part of the problem as well. And you need to rethink your Christian values in terms of helping others. Life is important from the beginning to the very end itself. Now, of course, there's difficult circumstances, incest, cases of rape, and so forth. And these are difficult cases. All I would like to say on that is I'm glad I wouldn't be walking in those particular shoes. But in the end, it's still a life. So I'll leave it just at that because I find it to be a very ethically muddy situation, muddy waters, unclear. But ultimately, I think the Holy Spirit speaks to us and says that there's still a life and something has to be done for that life. It's not that life's fault that that life is there. But again, to be a father of a young girl who was raped, I cannot even imagine so I really don't want to make a comment on that type of situation itself. Now, moving on from abortion, the culture of death looks to also push an agenda of euthanasia with the noble means to an end as to end suffering or what we would refer to as suicide, assisted suicide. So as Christians, we understand that suffering is an extremely important thing in life in this world because it builds not only character, but it also allows us to grow. Suffering plays a key role in Christian life through Jesus. Jesus is our redeemer and through suffering, through death came life and resurrection. So there's a real redemptive value between suffering when we unite our crosses with Christ. Our sacrifices alone are insignificant, but when we unite them with Christ, they carry value. Now, when we come to suffering, though, of those who are dying through terminal illness or very painful thing, there is a very high, very high demand that physicians and family members help preserve the dignity of the dying in terms of care, not just physical, but emotional and mental care that there is a pastoral thanatology taking place that looks at the needs of the whole person, preserving that dignity as best as possible. So the dying, they have a right to be pain-free, comfortable, 
and consoled to the best ability through medication and care itself. And of course, doctors are, are told or taught to take the Hippocratic Oath to never do harm. And ending a life, not on the terms of nature itself, but through artificial intervention is assisted suicide. And it is never right to end a life prematurely. Now, there are obviously situations that are not ending a life prematurely, but are concepts that deal with our dignity as human beings. So we have certain situations called ordinary and extraordinary conditions. An ordinary condition involves an individual who is suffering and probably terminal, and they, under these ordinary circumstances, are giving ways to maybe cure oneself or to prolong life through proven medications and procedures. They're time tested. So as Christians, God is the author of life, and we owe God our life. We are to respect our body as a temple of the Holy Spirit. And respecting our body as a temple of the Holy Spirit is important. And taking care of it through proper exercise, vitamins. But also in terms of taking the proper medications to purposely deny an ordinary condition, an ordinary method of preserving life is against the natural law. So if there is a proven methodology, we are obliged as Christians to take that, that type of care. Now, extraordinary methods or conditions involve the use of unproven medications and procedures that prolong life, but prolong life in such a way that it goes against the natural dignity of the individual artificially. So if someone is on a breathing ventilator machine and they're brain dead for the most part, Taking them off is not assisted suicide. Taking them off that ventilator and letting them die naturally with dignity is not assisted suicide. It is not artificial in itself. It's an extraordinary means. If someone is dying and they don't want to, and they're done and they don't want to take an unproven medication, they don't have to take that if they're willing just to accept what is to happen because it's unproven. So these are examples of extraordinary cases and so forth, and allowing the time that's given to go naturally and to allow God to take us when he wishes to take us. God does not wish us not to take proven scientific medical procedures, but unproven in extraordinary situations, you're allowed to die with dignity. It's not assisted suicide in these cases as you accept your role, your suffering. Now, are you to say no to possible pain medications that could make you less uh, lucid? No, you are definitely allowed to take these types of medications as long as you make your peace with God beforehand and you receive your necessary spiritual guidance and allow the medications then to ease the suffering. You don't have to purposely endure suffering like some of the saints. If there is something to take, you are more than permitted to take it if you are in a terminal situation. Again, dignity to reduce pain and so forth. So I think it's important to understand these ordinary and extraordinary conditions. And it's also important for individuals to have a living will that if something were to occur, something was to happen, then they're able to better communicate what they want with others. So others aren't making a decision in an extraordinary condition of what the outcome or the future is in regards to what they want. So that's something really to think about. So with abortion and euthanasia, that's obviously murder, but there are times when a life of a neighbor is taken. 
that burglar who comes in the middle of the night that attacks us, or on the battlefield when an, an opposing soldier comes with a bayonet. So there are examples of self-defense, which is actually a principle of the double effect where a single neutral action creates two outcomes. And in this moral dilemma, the two outcomes are you preserving your life and the other one, the individual dying. You can't have the at least licit intent of wanting that person to die, but your intent is to preserve your life and as an outcome, those things can occur. So in that regard, to kill is justified even though it is not desired. We have that with just war theory. Uh, obviously Nazi Germany was an evil empire and the allies had to come stop this evil. And this was a justifiable war for the allies to partake in. And unfortunately, killing occurred. Now, once an individual is subjugated, imprisoned in war, obviously, then it can turn to murder if an individual is killed, not in the purpose of self-preservation. So killing can quickly become murder in war if the individual does not hold strong to that moral compass that holds us together. Unfortunately, war, even the good guys, sometimes act bad. And such is the psychological strain of these types of things. But th that's a little bit on just war and self-defense within Christian theology. Government execution is a divided topic. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas taught that the government has a right to defend society that it governs. And if there is a, an external threat to that society, then government execution is justified. However, with modern day prisons and systems to protect society from the deviants, many individuals within Christian circles denounce capital punishment as murder, as the state overstepping its boundaries because the prison is an adequate system to keep the individual from harming society itself. So ultimately, it kind of depends on the state's ability to defend the population from the deviant. And if, the, if there's any, no other way to defend the state and the individuals from the deviant, then a public execution might be justified as the state using its God-giving authority. But many states might not have a legitimate authority, many governments, communist governments, and so forth. So it becomes a little bit of a clouded discussion when it comes to capital punishment. Obviously, in the United States, I think it's something that should not be condoned. I think it is uh, no way falling under the guidance of the state defending uh, the, end of the, the society from this particular in individual deviant. The deviant can be kept in prison. And lifelong prison is very well probably a greater punishment than an execution. And no matter how much we detest some of the things that these individuals do, there's a chance for individual while serving life in prison to find God and maybe save his or her own soul. So God is ultimately the author of life. And I think if everyone entered into this type of mindset, that God is the author of life and we're to treat our brothers and sisters with respect, a lot of these issues would not exist. But beyond that, how do we treat individuals? How do we treat those immigrants and refugees from other countries? Do we treat them as foreign invaders? How do we treat the homeless, the hungry? And how do we deal with our own feelings of anger and revenge? These are all things that we need to self-reflect on. Unfortunately, we have a two-party system. One is concerned about life in the womb, and, and, but doesn't care about life outside in regards to immigrants and refugees and the homeless. And then we have that one party who cares about that, but not life in the womb. So it's imbalanced. God is the author of life, but he expects us in all aspects of life to care for our brother and sisters, no matter the situation. 
And I think it's something as Christians that we need to reevaluate, especially some of us that put our politics above our faith itself. Like to thank you for listening about the culture of death today. We offer a Christian counseling certification. Below is a link to that particular program. There are individual courses, online courses that you can take that lead to a four year certification if qualified. Our phone is 330 652 7776, and our email is info at aihcp.org. So let's love our neighbor as ourselves as best as we can going forward, fight for the rights of the unborn, but also have that love that goes beyond the womb and that tries to dismiss the ideas of the culture of death where human beings are minimized to objects, to inconveniences, and that we find that the value of every human being is immense because everyone is made in the image and likeness of God. Thank you for listening and have a good day.